My life changed the summer of 1986 during a conversation with an Episcopal priest named David A. Works. I had just finished my junior year at BYU and had returned home to Topsfield, Massachusetts, and I was in the depths of a suicidal depression. I had a plan. I was just waiting for the opportunity to execute it. The Reverend Works was our next door neighbor. He had been one of the renegade Episcopal priests who irregularly ordained four women to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church in 1975. One day I saw him walking past our house and something deep inside me told me, you need to talk to him. So I looked him up in the neighborhood phone directory and called him and he invited me over for lunch the next day. During lunch, I asked the Reverend Works, what had made him decide to become an Episcopal priest? He told me how he was a former Marine and a drunk. He would drink, he'd get into fights, he'd get thrown into jail. And one day in jail, after a particularly bad night, he realized that he needed help, and so he prayed. And Jesus Christ appeared to him in his jail cell and spoke to him. This changed his life. He gave his life to God, he sobered up, and eventually he became a priest. The good reverend hired me to work in his garden, and it was there, working on my hands and knees, caring for green living things, that I gradually forgot about killing myself. The story of Reverend Works, it seemed to me, was not very different from the stories of Paul or Alma or Joseph Smith. It proved to me that God is alive and that he can intervene in our lives in unpredictable ways and unpredictable situations. Later that summer, I received my own vision and the Lord spoke to me, told me that he knew me, that I belonged to him and that my being gay was part of how I was knit together from my inmost being. Mormons have it as an article of faith that God still speaks to us today, that God is as active in the world today as in scriptural times. Terrell Givens, a Mormon studies scholar, has shown how the wide gulf that separates God from human beings for most of the rest of Christendom is radically collapsed for Mormons. Mormons believe in a God who is very much in our midst, in our day-to-day -day lives, so much so, says Givens, that Mormons are notorious for their lack of a sense of mystery in their worship and in their theology. God is just there with us all the time. But over time, as another Mormon studies scholar, Tom Mould, has argued, Mormons have adopted very prescribed ideas about how and under what circumstances God will speak to us and what God will say to us when he does. Mormons have very clear cultural norms they use to judge whether a spiritual experience comes from God or the devil or is just plain crazy. <laughs> Since correlation, Mormons also, we tend to read the scriptures in very prescribed ways, seeing in the scriptures the same handbook prescribed interpretations and morals over and over again. This makes it harder for us to see ourselves in the scriptures. And so when we struggle, we often feel ashamed, forgetting that the saints of scripture also struggled. We're often afraid and confused and in despair, found scripture difficult to understand and couldn't see how to apply it in their lives and doubted and disbelieved. Our lives are not so different from theirs. Scripture is not a manual full of clear-cut instructions. It shows us patterns of how saints struggled and found answers in the past. It offers us hope that our struggles have meaning and that our questions can find answers. It promises us that God is real and that God loves us, but we have to do the struggling and the seeking. And in that seeking, God will speak to us in ways that others may not understand, but that we recognize. 
For LGBT Mormons, it's particularly difficult to see ourselves in the scheme of sacred history because of how Mormons have constructed their identity in the 20th century. In this process, Mormons have been both victims and victimizers, and I think it's helpful for us to understand how this has happened. Group identities, such as Mormon identity, are created through a cultural process of negotiation within the group and interactions between the group and other groups. Sociologists call this identity work. Mormon sociologist Armin Moss has shown how 19th century Mormon identity work drew Mormons into an Israelite lineage that included Jews and American Indians and excluded blacks. In doing this, Mormons drew on popular beliefs that the scattering of the tribes of Israel had resulted in Anglo-Saxons having Israelite blood, while blacks were subject to the curse of Ham. In the 19th century, evangelical Protestants drew Mormons outside of the circle of Christian identity. Um, in doing this, uh, they, they did this by defining Mormons as sexual deviants. And this process played itself out through a federal anti-polygamy campaign that involved, among other things, a military occupation of the Utah Territory, political disenfranchisement of Mormon men and women, and incarceration and exile of Mormon leaders. Mormon historian D. Michael Quinn says that this was traumatic for Mormons. In the 20th century, Mormons sought to draw themselves back into the circle of Christian identity by embracing evangelical Protestant sexual and gender mores, including monogamy and more constrained domestic roles for women. In the 20th century, the LDS Church cooperated with the federal government in anti-polygamy raids, now against Mormon fundamentalists. Mormons continued to view blacks as outside of God's covenant with Israel, and they developed popular theologies of blacks as disloyal to God and pre-mortal existence. In the 19th century, Mormons viewed homosexuality as a minor flaw that occurred naturally among Mormons. In other words, Mormons had homosexuality. In the 20th century, to be gay came to be viewed as inherently incompatible with being Mormon. And Mormon popular theologies reified conventional gender roles as eternal. And anything outside the dominant gender paradigm was labeled as gender confusion. And we've seen that term, gender confusion, in some of the talks that we've heard over pulpits for, for decades. So a core idea of scripture in, in, in the gospel is that human culture naturally tends toward idolatry. The Tower of Babel in the Old Testament, the great and spacious building in the Book of Mormon, Babylon the Great in the Book of Revelation are all symbolic expressions of this idea. When God appears as an actor in scripture, it is almost always as a disruptor of human cultural norms and as a liberator of those who've been ground under the wheels of cultural progress. Paul captured this key element of the gospel when he wrote, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. We need to remember that when we're feeling weak. In August 2005, in a way I found impossible to deny, the Spirit spoke to me and told me it was time to come back to the LDS Church, even though I'm excommunicated and even though I should remain committed to my husband. So I started attending my ward in Minneapolis, Minnesota shortly thereafter, and I've continued to be active in the 10 years since. About a year after I started going to church again, 
I found a remarkable book entitled Black and Mormon, edited by Newell Bringhurst and Darren Smith. This book documents the spiritual experiences of black Mormons who stuck with the LDS Church prior to 1978 in the face of incredible hatred, not to mention the denial of priesthood and temple blessings. Individuals told of being on the verge of leaving the Mormon Church for good, and then receiving a compelling personal revelation that gave them peace and helped them find a way forward in the church. Their spiritual experiences were so similar to the ones that I had had just recently within the past year. Over the years, I have come to know a growing number of LGBT individuals who have had similar experiences. And many of us are members of Affirmations Prepare Group a group for LGBT individuals who are active or who desire to be active in the LDS church. The stories of hundreds of LGBT Mormons receiving affirmation and guidance from God have been documented in recent research by John DeLynn, Bill Bradshaw, Renee Gallagher, and Catherine Crowell. And now in affirmation, I am in the process of collecting stories and collecting testimonies of LGBT Mormons, and it is a powerful powerful thing to see them. Our stories of doubt and of faith, of losing ourselves and of finding ourselves and of finding God are powerful. It's vital that we record our stories, that we share them, because they will become the next chapter of scripture for future generations of faithful saints. <laughs> 